Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey Lane. Hey everyone. So friends, today we are, it is hot in Virginia. That's where Lane and I are. We're in Southeastern Virginia. Lane's in Williamsburg. I'm in Newport News. We're about 25, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, depending on, you know, traffic and stuff. And it is hot. Oh, hot. Yes. I know. I just got a text message saying there's an excessive heat warning again for the second time this week. Yeah. And so I've already harvested flowers this morning. We started early and got finished early. And um, so it is that time of the year. And I'm just happy to be indoors making a podcast, talking seed talk with Lane. And so friends, if you're new here, we welcome you with, we're rolling out the red carpet for you. And um, if you want to learn more about the work that we do here at the Gardener's Workshop, who sponsors this podcast, you can learn more over at thegardenersworkshop.com. We have a fully stocked online garden shop. Lane is the seed manager over there. And we also have a library of online courses, tons of free resources. There's a lot of stuff over there. If you're looking for any information, whether you're flower farming or a budding cutting garden home gardener. Um, So we're just happy to have you on board. And Lane, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I hope everyone is staying cool out there. Like Lisa said, it's been so hot. And I told Lisa, if you listen to last week's episode, this is going to make sense to you. But when I went outside today, I told Lisa it was no talking weather. So if you don't know what that means, go back and listen to last week's episode. So today we are going to be talking about a crop that seems like it was kind of made for fall. Don't you think, Lisa? I we are totally gonna... and completely agree. We are talking about amaranth. So we're just going to be talking about some different things, some tips and tricks to help you out, how to space them, how to pinch them, some things to know about the seedlings, and of course, different varieties. So it should be fun. Yes. And um, yeah, amaranth, one of my very, very favorites. And saying that, Lane, if you all are listening to this on a podcast app, pop on over to YouTube. Lane always puts together a beautiful slideshow to go along um, with what we're kind of chatting about. And I do have my amaranth harvest from just this morning. So you don't want to miss it. Yes. Okay, let's get started. So Lisa, before we even get into everything about amaranth, what's the first thing you think of when you think of amaranth? I'm just curious because I know what it is when I think of it. I think pests. (laughs) That's what I think of. (laughs) I mean, it's probably one of the pet. It is. It is the peskiest crop that I currently still grow. There have been many other pesky crops but I dropped them like a hot potato, right? And I mean, it's like they were worth growing. Amaranth has so many good qualities that I am willing to take the bullet and deal with the pest situation, um, you know, because there's nothing like, I mean, the picture you have up is just, I mean, it's like screaming fall. I agree with you completely. So let me just describe amaranth in case anyone isn't familiar. It's a warm season crop and amaranth has these, beautiful, very textural blooms. They almost look like they have a velvety quality to them. And we're going to talk in just a minute how they're different species, but there are upright plume forms that you can get. There are rope-like trailing forms. There are so many different colors to choose from. Like you can see in the picture, if you're watching on YouTube, there are greens, there are oranges, there are pinks, there are burgundies. Some are even bicolors. They have a mixture of colors. And you can find varieties that have green foliage, some have red foliage, and they're all so interesting and add so much texture to an arrangement and to the garden. And these are another one that just look fantastic by themselves in a vase. So Lisa, what do you like about amaranth as a flower farmer? So I'm just sitting here looking at them in a really different way than I think I have ever really looked at them. Um, (laughs) They are so textural. That is just so amazing. And I'm thinking, how have I sold these throughout all the years, right? Well, it's, it's the fact that a, I would always tend to grow them. They, while they will grow all summer, I tended to hold back growing them until late summer and fall. So it was always a new crop because they do look so fall related, but I loved them to make bouquets of just amaranth. Do you know what I mean? To Me too. 
the different colors. I mean, that was a great fall bouquet to sell at the farmer's market and it can be hung to dry. So you could sell it fresh and it's something you could say, you know, you can dry this. Um, so I think it just, they have a lot of really cool options and our florist absolutely loved them. Would you say the demand for them was higher in the fall or was it equal throughout the year? Sure. No, I would say, well, we, we primarily only had them literally in the fall, you know, late summer, September yeah. and October was when I tried to have those crops really coming in heavy. Um, and also because the pest pressure wouldn't be quite as heavy in the fall, right. right. As it is early in the summer. Um, but oh yeah, our floral customers, our florist, absolutely. I mean, if you look at this picture, who would not want that? Um, the biggest challenge that I had to overcome and a lot of people struggle with is how to make the blooms usable sizes so they aren't huge. But you want right. to know what else I think of? I was just remembering this that you just asked me a minute ago. What did I think of when I look at this is Dr. Seuss. Just oh. some of those crazy, quirky, weird flowers and shapes and objects. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Yes. And they are a perfect fall crop. Like Lisa just mentioned, there are a lot of different interesting shapes. We've already mentioned there are a lot of colors, a lot of warm colors that look really amazing yes. in the fall. They have a fast number of days to maturity. It's usually somewhere in the realm of 65 to 75 days. That might vary depending on which variety you're growing, but it's usually somewhere in that range. And also amaranth is a short day plant. So it actually blooms faster when the days are shorter. Have you experienced that, Lisa? Yes. And that is, I was going to say, it's one of those crops that I would say, oh my gosh, let's just start some more of this and see yeah. if we can't get it to come in. Because in fact, if the temperatures are warm enough, as the days get shorter, it fuels the fire of this guy's reproduction. Plus, because they are such ginormous plants, Typically, I mean, some of them, like the ones that I've just cut today, some of them were over my head high. Thinking about growing them fast in the fall, the plants won't be as big, they'll be smaller, the, tims, the stems will not be as thick, all things that I struggle to get because those are the qualities that I want. They tend right. to be ginormous. Okay, so I mentioned before that there are two different forms of amaranth to be aware of for our purposes, and they correspond to different species. And there are a lot of different species of amaranth out there, but today we're just going to be focusing on the two that we tend to grow. So one is more of an upright plume form, and that's amaranthus cruentus. And then there are some that have trailing, draping, rope-like forms, and that's amaranthus caudatus. And those are the ones with those cascading tassels. If you think of love lies bleeding, right. that is that type of amaranth. Do you prefer one to the other, Lisa? Nope. They both have, I mean, they're both so useful, but again, especially the, the draping um, rope ones, they can be really, really long, which is really, really cool, but it's not very useful in a bouquet. So right. one of the things that we've experienced this year, I planted them super tight and pinched the heck out of them all trying to make the stems smaller in the blooms. And it has worked really, really well. If they're just more usable, you don't want anything over six to eight inches long draping because it's just not very usable in a mixed bouquet. Okay. So I wanted to just mention about the seedlings of amaranth. They tend to germinate quickly and they can get leggy very quickly. It just seems to be in their nature. What are some tips about that, Lisa, for people that are experiencing leggy amaranth seedlings? Sure. So amaranth is in, and as a general blanket um, statement, is generally a really quick sprouter. And what do people think when I say that? Well, I think they think two to four days. We have had some of the varieties of amaranth that literally Bobo sowed it today at noon and at tonight at nine o'clock, if I'd have come out and looked in the germination chamber, they had already sprouted. I mean, amaranth has got some varieties or some um, types that are super vigorous, invasive, 
trouble causing plants. And this is part of it. They germinate quick, they grow quick, they go to flower quick, which means they reseed quickly. So we have found that literally when Bobo sows them that day, I check the chamber that night, late, right before I go to bed or very first thing the next morning, because if they just spend that overnight in darkness in the germination chamber or in a dark room on a heat mat, they start to bend and stretch and they quickly get tangly and just a mess. Yeah. So watch out for your seedlings germinating yes. and move them under lights very quickly. Do you even wait for them to have 50% germinated, Lisa, to move them under lights? Or do you tend to get amaranth under the lights even sooner? Well, it just depends. You know, I mean, if it's, if we've got sprouting happening at 12 hours, I move them even if yeah. it's not 50%. But if you have, you know, some of the other varieties, some of the varieties may take two to seven days. You know what I mean? There's such a range in the different varieties. So those I would wait for the 50%, but those quick ones, yes, I think I move them the first sign of them starting to sprout that early. Okay, moving on. So before you transplant your amaranth outside, you need to have an idea of how you're going to space it. And this is another one where the head size can be influenced by your spacing. So it's a good idea to know what size head you're going for before you even transplant it out. So you alluded to this earlier, but what is kind of the ideal head size that you're going for or the ideal length of those cascading tassels that you would like to have as a flower farmer? And then we're going to talk about how pinching and spacing can influence that. Sure. So it depends on who you're, what you're using them for, 100%. Um, so surprisingly enough, you might be able to sell, depending on how big your market, your farmer's market traffic situation is, you might be able to sell one or two little mixed bunches of just amaranth that are supersized, you know, because they look cool and different, but nobody knows what to do with them. You know, I mean, where, where do you put them in your home? What do you, I mean, unless somebody's having a big event or something. Um, so, but on the other hand, we sold to one particular florist that did what was called lobby work. That meant they did big hotel lobby arrangements. I mean, those are the humongous, you know, they're on six foot wide round tables in the middle of the room and they need a big flower arrangement. And that was kind of our specialty because they florists have a really hard time getting tall stuff because of shipping, you know, that are getting shipped in. So they could use some of these whoppers and a whopper would be anything over six to eight inches. Um, anything beyond that, it's really hard to use. I mean, think about putting together a bouquet of sunflowers and, you know, zinnias and maybe coxcomb and marigolds or whatever. You know, if you had a three to five inch spike or trailing amaranth, it would just fit in like a really cool accent. You don't want it to take the bouquet over. So I would say that three to five inch for the head size, whether it's draping or spiked, would be in a perfect world. Bigger than that, you limit the amounts of use. And anything smaller than that, I mean, you know, three inch, just three, nothing wrong with three inch blooms. Yeah. And if you are going for a dramatic statement, whether that's in your garden, they look great in the garden when you let them grow larger. Or yeah. I have a vase downstairs. That's a really huge vase that I like to put really tall statement things in. That's a place where yeah. the large plumes or the huge cascading tassels, they look good just by themselves in there. That way they're not right. competing with other stuff that's in a vase, right. but obviously there are so many different ways to use the bigger or the smaller blooms. So just experiment as always to find out what works best for you or your customers. But do know that sometimes the really large blooms can be a little bit more difficult to work into your standard mixed bouquets. Yes. So how do you like to space these two different types of amaranth and how does that influence the head size? So our standard spacing has been, you know, 30 inch wide bed, four rows, six inches apart. Um, and when you do that and don't pinch, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, this bay, this bucket of amar mixed amaranth that Lane has up, which is just so beautiful. Um, those were spaced six inches apart, four rows and a 30 inch bed and not pinched. They're whoppers. They're pretty big blooms. I mean, those blooms are probably, I would guess, 12 
you know, 10 to 18 inches from top of bloom to bottom. Um, and that's what that produced. Um, so what we then started doing was, okay, we'll follow what everybody says and we'll pinch 50% of the crop, one side of the bed at that spacing in our attempt to actually get smaller stems and more of them and smaller heads. And that does work. However, I have found a couple of these amaranths when you pinch them, I mean, they're well established. They're 18 inches tall in the garden. You pinch them back because I think because of our pest pressure. And a lot of times they get defoliated lower on the plant. So there's no leaf surface for photosynthesis and all that good stuff to happen. If you pinch back a plant that had leaves, no foliage on the plant, they die. Um, so that's what we've done for all these years is to pinch half um, and see what happened. Well, now we learned from research um, that if you just plant them much closer together um, and you can pinch them, but you don't maybe necessarily have to, um, like, like spacing like we do stock and lisianthus, like eight rows across a 30 inch bed, um, that will solve the thick stem, big head problem. And it's just easier. You don't have to worry about pinching them. Um, so pinch and or just plant them tighter together. So do you space the upright and trailing forms the same? Do you treat them the same in terms of spacing and pinching out there in the yes, garden? Yes, we do. And how tall do these typically get? Well, the, <laughs> the ones that, um, the uprights that we're looking at on the left side of the screen um, were probably eight to 10 feet tall. They were whoppers. Um, and the trailing, I find in general, the trailing varieties don't quite go that tall. And these were obviously unpinched. Those were huge um, blooms. I mean, we were leaving those in the actual garden. Um, but yeah, they get very, very tall. So what's the most effective way you found to support amaranth plants since they can get so tall and top heavy? Yes, they get really top heavy. You're right. Um, and when the, but when the stems are that big and it's that tall, even netting can't save them. Um, so I've done different styles. You know, I'm not a crower. Crowing is a type of supporting where people put stakes and strings. I just find it takes so much longer and not as effective as floral support netting. Um, but I have used crowing on amaranth, especially when they're tall and a storm is coming, just trying to give them some general strength to keep them from going down. Um, but in general, my policy is now we do not do anything to them. If they go down, we lose those stems. Um, and again, we're trying to keep them shorter and smaller. So we yes. don't really grow them that tall unless we're trying to have a great display in the garden or something. Yeah. And the height might vary anyways, based on which particular variety you're sure. growing, yeah. as well as the growing conditions and whether or not you pinch the plants. Sure. So will both of these forms go on to regrow and produce new stems after you've cut the initial stems? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, the hanging that um, I have the green tails um, and the coral fountains that I harvested today, most of the plants that most of those stems were cut from plants that had malt. I mean, I've cut multiple stems from them. So yeah, you cut them and they come again. Do you have any idea of an estimate of the number of stems that you typically get per plant in your growing conditions? Sure. I would probably say anywhere from two to six. It just really depends on the variety. Um, but if you cut them um, and cut deep, you know, like you do for any cutting garden, flower, um, down low where there's buds, those stems will just develop. And yeah. Okay, so we can't talk about amaranth without talking about pest issues. One of the major pests, at least in our area, seems to be the pigweed flea beetle. They start damaging the leaves even when they're just seedlings. Yeah. But the thing I'm always so amazed by with amaranth is that even when the leaves are just completely full of holes, most of the time the plants still seem to go on to produce flowers. Yeah. Is that what you've found as well? I mean, they're pretty amazing plants, aren't they? I mean, holy cow. Um, so yes, I mean, it doesn't really matter how much damage if the leaves are totally laced, meaning they, right. you know, the, the beetles have just eaten everything but the, you know, edges. 
Um, they still, the, the bloom still looks pretty good. Now the, the beetles will get on the blooms occasionally. I think at some point in their life cycle, perhaps, and maybe call, they don't damage the bloom by eating it, but they soil the bloom. Um, and so that's a problem with the lighter colors, but yeah, they, they just kind of grow in spite of the pests. And yes, the one that we have the biggest trouble with is um, the, the amor the pigweed amaranth um, flea beetle. And yes. we, I mean, I'm telling y'all, if you need to do a study on flea beetles, just plant some amaranth. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty amazing. And we have our other run of the mill issues. You know, there's some cucumber beetles you'll see around. Um, some of the other pests that we have a very light population of everybody, I think kind of migrates to these plants because they are being damaged so much by the flea beetles that makes the plants send out, you know, those hormones that, Hey, I'm a weak plant over here. Come and get me. So you can kind of do a bug study on our amaranth. I'm pretty sure. Yes, they can end up being covered. And like Lisa mentioned, the leaves do get a lacy sort of look when these beetles have been eating on them. So it is important to just remove every bit of foliage yes, from your harvested stems for sure. if your foliage is damaged like this. Yeah. And um, I actually just saw somewhere where somebody was talking about, you mean we have to remove the foliage? <laughs> it's like, I can remember actually, I mean, this was back when I was just starting out and I was so ignorant back then, you know, I just, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And I can remember having on my sale list, some of this big jumbo amaranth, and it was to that florist that does that big lobby work. And he said, oh my gosh, I'll take it off. Well, I was, it was so hot because it's this time of the year, you know, I mean, that's when the amaranth is coming in. Right. And I did not strip it thoroughly. <laughs> I left a bunch of leaves and I mean, I walked in the back door. These amaranth were so big. They were like walking sticks. And when I walked in his back door and I'd been selling to him probably for two years. So we were very well acquainted. He just looked at me and looked at those stems and he said, and you're expecting me to use it like that. <laughs> so I'm just, that was a real lesson for me. You have to remove it because not only does the foliage block a lot of the pretty part of the bloom sometimes, but it's just bug damage and you don't even want to give that impression. Right. And that may mean snipping out those leaves at the top. You might not just be able to run your glove down the stem. Exactly. So funny, sad story. So that's become Susie's official job. And literally the bucket that's sitting behind me has not been defoliated because guess what? When Susie walks in tomorrow morning, she grabs the clipper and just goes to work. And she is so quick at it now. But yes, yeah, she used a clipper to clip everything that I didn't just strip off with my glove during the harvest process. She snips off with a pair of clippers. So because these are so attractive to that pigweed flea beetle, I know with some other crops that might be thrift magnets or some other sort of pest magnet, you've eliminated them from your garden. Is that a concern for you with this or will you still just continue to grow it even though they attract those pests? So it's a love-hate thing. First off, <laughs> um, the, the flea beetles tend to stay on the amaranth. I mean, we don't sustain a lot of damage on the other crops that we grow because, you know, I mean, I, I don't grow dahlias, um, which would be a, you can't hear where we are. I don't know how you could grow amaranth and dahlias at the same time because those flea beetles will tore our dahlias up. Um, so the reason that I've continued growing this amaranth um, is because we don't suffer a lot of damage on our other crops. However, um, you know, we have not, we didn't grow amaranth during our high production years. Um, not every, we did in the beginning, but then I dropped it just because it was buggy and it needed to be defoliated. We were so busy. Right. And then we brought it back. Cause I, I mean, the blooms are significant. There's nothing else like them. There's just really nothing else like it. And treating for pests is not really an option. You know, we just don't use any kind of pesticides at all. Um, so the jury is out whether we'll continue, but our flea beetle population had basically vanished because we had stopped growing amaranth, the amaranth family. And now it, we're, I mean, two years of growing them and we're back at full populations. Um, so it's just one more example of 
You know, sometimes just giving up a crop eliminates your problem. And this would be one. Growers have to evaluate, is it worth growing this family for the damage potentially if the flea beetles are an issue in your region? I was going to mention that as well, that this pest damage that we're talking about, it might be regional. So don't not try amaranth just because we have pest problems. Definitely make sure to try it and see if it works for you. Exactly. Jesse, that lives in Kansas, says they don't have flea beetles there. So guess what? Amaranth would be a big crop for me in that circumstance. So you have to really apply test and apply for your individual um, situation. All right, Lisa. So how do you know when to harvest amaranth? When it's at that proper size that you like, how do you make the decision now is the time to cut? So the blooms are made up of these tiny little flowers, if you want to call them that. And when about a third or more of them are open is when I start looking at it. And then the next thing I think is, are you big enough as a bloom to actually make a difference in a bouquet, right? Um, But once they start to get, um, they start to shed, um, that that usually starts at the bottom, I think, of the blooms. Um, And when you see that little yellow shedding coming along the pollen, I mean, you've missed your chance. Um, You either need to let it go completely through that shedding process before you cut it. So your goal is to cut it before that. So I'm always in every crop trying to see how early I can cut something and have it hydrate. Um, And we really do that with amaranth. And do you cut at the same stage if you're planning on drying them? Um, Drying, we let them go through the full process. Um, Let them shed and just get fully and completely developed and then hopefully have several days of no rain. And that's when we harvest them. And something else we should also mention is it's not always a good idea to fully let them go to seed in your garden unless you Mm. want a lot of amaranth in your garden the next year. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, amaranth is a really strong reseeder. And um, yeah, that is for sure. Yeah, so definitely be careful with that. And one more quick note about drying amaranth. If you have the upright plume spike forms, you can go ahead and hang those upside down to dry. If you have the trailing forms, you might want to let those dry right side up just to help maintain that natural form. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some favorite varieties, and there are so many to choose from. We can't go through them all. So I'm going to start with some of the trailing draping bloom ones. Coral Fountain has these beautiful coral pink tassels. What do you think about that, Lisa? Well, that's just a great color, right? I mean, so that's a hot color, has been in the floral world for the last several years, but it also is a perfect fall color because it really goes with anything. So we really love coral fountains. Dreadlocks looks like these knotted ropes that are kind of a magenta pink. What do you have to say about dreadlocks? I mean, I just love all the humpy bumpies, you know, I mean, and again, because I sold to florists that just love this unusual stuff, it just really gave their, I mean, if if they had, if they were creative and knew what to do with something different, they loved them. So I, they loved them. I loved them. There's also one called Mira that kind of has a similar form to dreadlocks, but it's green and rose bicolor. That is really, really pretty. Um, Love that just because of the color makes it universal. You can use it in anything. Yes. Okay, now let's move into some of the upright forms. So I think my favorite named amaranth has got to be Hot Biscuits, which is a golden, orangey, bronze, chestnut. How would you describe it? Yeah, chestnut is a really good amber comes to mind. Um, yeah, yeah, and that is like the fall color, right? I mean, it's tan. It's rich and deep and it goes with everything. And yeah, I love that one. And with that name, who could go wrong? Yeah, how could you resist? And then Autumn's Touch is green with sort of, copper chestnut touches to it. And the longer you leave it in there, um, the longer it, I mean, the more it kind of changes over. So I actually have one of those here. Oh, so this is, you can see it kind of starts out like this, all green, but as it matures, it gets this amazing amber color that comes along, which is so beautiful. I mean, This is just so amazing. And you can see the foliage is what Susie will be doing, a removal 
tomorrow morning on this. I mean, I don't mind doing it. It's just time consuming. And the whole way to make this flower profitable as a flower farmer is to have a really efficient way to do this. Um, and yeah, because let me tell you, if you send a bunch of flowers with buggy leaves like that, they're going to instantly think all your flowers have bugs. And yes. that's a whole new problem. So that's really, really pretty. Okay. And then there's another one called Oshberg, which is more wine colored and it has a little bit wispier blooms. It's not the same form as the other plume ones. It's a little bit wispier. Would you say? It's like a plume with much longer individual looser flowers or something, right? Yes. They're wispy. And so that if you're on YouTube, it's those, both of those stems on the right hand side of that board, um, the flat, um, flat lay. Both of those top and bottom are that. And I will say that is a very unusual and would maybe even be one of my favorites. If I had to narrow it down, that would be a favorite. That is a very pretty one. It's very elegant. Yeah. And then velvet curtains is a wine color, but it also has reddish stems and foliage, which if you live somewhere where pests are a problem, maybe that wouldn't matter to you, but it still does have red stems. And I have some. And you can see how dark it is. Really pretty blooms, dark foliage, dark stems. Um, and this is really, I mean, wine and fall, right? I mean, that is so very, very pretty. Um, I can't resist pulling the stems of the leaves <laughs> off of them. Um, but yeah, so velvet curtains is another really great favorite, which does respond in my um, experience perfectly to pinching. Okay. Last question is, what are some of your favorite flowers to pair with amaranth in bouquets? Any of that fall. I tell you one thing that looks really great. Um, hairy balls, gumpocarpus, physocarpus, which is another fall bloomer, right? Grasses, sunflowers, particularly if you've got some of the um, bi colors or the dark colors work really, really well. Said grasses, um, basils. And again, it really depends on are you, if you've got big giant blooms or if you're just making fall arrangements. Um, some of the later blooming like triloba, rudbeckias that are later in the season um, really do beautiful. And of course, coxcomb, as long as you got it in the right colors, would be really pretty. All right. Well, to summarize, just make sure you pick the right form of amaranth, depending on the look that you're going for. Make sure you move those seedlings under light in a timely manner because they're very quick to get leggy. Space them tightly if you want smaller, more usable heads, or you can go wider if you want those big dramatic blooms. Experiment with pinching and ways to support your plants, and then plan on stripping that foliage if you live somewhere where pest damage is an issue. That sounded pretty perfect. And you know, I keep after amaranth because the blooms are so beautiful and they're just such a perfect fit. And so maybe try starting later in the season to avoid some of the heavy pest damage. So yes, that's a really good idea. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Hopefully that inspired you to try growing some amaranth or answered some questions that you might be having. Make sure you follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And remember, we always appreciate you leaving ratings or reviews in a podcast app and likes and comments over on YouTube. So thanks again for joining us. And Lane, thanks for that beautiful slideshow. And friends, you can learn more about us over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And we hope you drop in sometime soon. So until we meet again, friends, bye, Lane. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.